So this is what the question says. It says at a particular instant, a hot air balloon is some height in the air. So let me start by just sketching the situation. That's how I like to start all the uh, physics questions, uh, mainly to make sure that I'm absorbing the information that's uh, in the question. And uh, once you sketch it out, sometimes you can see more easily whether the question has given you a complete set of information. So um, I have some hot air balloon that has some height and descending at a constant speed. Oh, all right. So let me... Um, Put this speed so it has some speed of v naught. At this exact instant, a girl throws a ball horizontally. All right, so there's a ball being thrown out horizontally, and I know I'm sketching it slightly wrong. I'll correct that in a bit. Uh, let me label this v i for v initial um, relative to herself with an initial speed of. So this is my v i, and let me just label this as my v naught. Okay, when she lands, where will she find the ball? So what we are looking for is that this ball that's been launched, it's going to undergo projectile motion and land somewhere. And you are looking for this range of um, the ball dropping, or the horizontal distance from where the uh, balloon and the girl was. So I said that I'm, I'm drawing this VI wrong because um, this is the situation you have to think through. Imagine that you are in a, um, you are in a, a hot air balloon, which is moving at some speed. And I guess it's easiest to think of the simplest scenario where you have the ball that you simply release from where you are. You are not dropping it, you are not throwing it, you are not trying to give it any speed, you are just uh, dropping it. And once you think of the situation, I hope it comes to you intuitively that before you drop the ball, the ball was moving with the hot air balloon. So it was already moving at speed of a So when you let go of it, it's not going to suddenly go to zero speed and then start accelerating. It'll accelerate from this speed. So there's this idea of inherited speed, that when you um, launch a ball, when you drop a ball, when you throw a ball from something that's already moving, that it's going to have an initial velocity. So this ball that's being launched horizontally, it's actually going to have a vertical velocity in the reference frame of Earth. So really the initial initial velocity of this ball it's going to be a combination of this vertical velocity and this horizontal velocity that the ball is being fired with. So, um, so that's a consideration that you have to put in. If you forgot to do that and you went through the rest of the calculations that we are going to and got, get, got a wrong answer, that would be why the answer you get is wrong. So, uh, so I think uh, this uh, situation that I've sketched out, it looks complete to me. I don't feel like I need any additional information. So um, let's just uh, start um, figuring out what, uh, what equations we need to use. So especially, you're going to see this approach, especially with the kinematics, where um, so in the textbook, they've derived these equations for uh, motion under constant acceleration. And let me write the version for projectile motion, because with the projectile motion, there's just a bit of a simplification. The two simplifying uh, assumptions or conditions being that the x component of acceleration is zero. So any horizontal kind of motion, you can say velocity is constant. And the other simplification is that you know what the y component of acceleration is. It's going to be minus g, where minus indicates downward acceleration. So under these conditions of projectile motion, you can write these um, kinematics formulas for uh, motion under constant acceleration. So the x component is going to be really simple. So the position that you horizontal displacement is going to be initial displacement plus the horizontal velocity, which will be constant because of this. Horizontal velocity times amount of time. That's it. 
And I can write down a few different expressions for the vertical displacement. I guess I'll start out with the kind of the basic one. And then if I need to bring in additional equations, then I will do that. The most basic one that's helpful a lot of times is the one that expresses the vertical position. So the vertical position is the same part as the horizontal one, you know, initial uh, y position. And you have um, change in the y position that comes from the initial velocity, uh, vy initial times time. And then you have a part of the displacement that you can attribute to in some sense from the acceleration. Uh, minus one half the acceleration, g, oh, I already put in the minus sign, uh, times time squared. And uh, the, in the textbook and in lecture, we went through the derivation for these. So, um, I'll uh, leave detailed derivations to those. And, um, and uh, especially with the vertical motion, I can write additional equations for the vertical component of velocity and so on. But um, I will, uh, I'll see if I need them. If I need them, I'll write them down. I'm hoping I don't need them. We'll see. So we are being asked for the range, which in some sense you can relate to what you have from the horizontal displacement. So this range is going to be my horizontal displacement at some final time. Well, time when the, the ball lands. Um, so I guess using that uh, formula, it'll be x naught, which is going to be zero. Let me just make things easy. This position is x equals zero. So no initial x position uh, plus my I'm given initial horizontal velocity. Let me just use that. Initial horizontal velocity times time, final. So looking at this expression, it looks like I don't have the time final. Once I have it, my work would be done. So my goal really is to find this time final. When does the ball land? And that's, uh, that's really the uh, question that's uh, often answered by the y component of motion. So, um, so I'm just going to start there because I have a sense from having done this type of question many times that I can work through the vertical component of motion to figure out what time it double lands. And once I know that, then the rest is simple. So. Let me write down the version of this equation with uh, um, all the parts. So my, um, well, let me start with my final y position, which will be zero, by the way. Um, so zero is going to be equal to this particular expression for zero. My initial y position, h, plus my initial y speed, and let me be careful here. I made this mistake before. Um, so I'm going to, so this is the uh, convention I will follow for most of the semesters. Whenever I see signed quantities, meaning whenever I see quantities where positive and negative means different directions, I'm going to put those signs into my equation. And all my symbols, as far as I can make it, they'll be positive and all the signs will be my equation. So here, I'm going to try to keep V naught as positive. So this downward initial y velocity, I should express it as minus V naught times T final. I'm looking for y position at a particular time. And finally, minus 1 half G T final squared. So I guess uh, I, I could, uh, and I'm looking at it and uh, <laughs> despairing a little bit, or you know, being disappointed. Maybe despair is too strong. It looks like I have non-zero terms for constant, linear, and the quadratic term, which means um, I don't have an easy way to solve it other than to you know put this into the standard form: minus one half g t final squared minus v naught t final plus h is equal to zero. Then, you know, label this as my a. That's the whole point of putting this into standard form, b and c, and use the quadratic formula. You know, say t final is going to be, oh, do I remember this? <laughs> um, minus b plus minus square root of uh, b squared minus 4 AC 
square rooted divided by 2a. Uh, so you could do that and you know you should know how to do that by hand. I feel like I probably done this enough in enough uh, projectile motion questions. So let me use this opportunity to actually use the, uh, the Sage math, the computer algebra system to do this algebra for me so that I don't have to really do this by hand. Okay, so I think I'm all set up for um, using my computer algebra system. So this is what I'm gonna do. I have uh, my equation. So let me uh, first uh, declare the variables that uh, the symbols that I need to use. So they're gonna be g, t final, v naught, um, and h. And if I need, uh, forget, remember I forgot anything, I can just uh, uh, do this again with the additional variables. So with these variables, um, I can write down an equation. Equation one is equal to minus one half times g times t final squared minus v naught times t final plus h. Um, so I want to draw a distinction between this is an assignment symbol and this is an equality symbol. So I'm assigning this equation that says left hand side is equal to zero into this equation. Um, so, okay, I have those set up and I need to solve this equation for t final. So there's a function called solve. Um, I'm more used to using this function for, um, for um, linear equations, <laughs> but let's see if this will work. Uh, if this works, then I can just do it. And uh, this is the built-in documentation for Sage Math. So if you help solve, the most uh, useful part of documentation I find are the examples. Uh, if I wasn't familiar with how to use it, this is what I would uh, look through to see, oh, uh, that looks like that's what I want to do and kind of copy it at least until I become more familiar with how to use these things. So let me do the solve thing. Solve equation one. I've already typed in all my equations the way it would be done there. And I want to solve for t final, and I think that's it. And it'll uh, treat everything else as a known quantity, uh, something that I can plug in numerical values for. And uh, to, that's uh, gonna hopefully give me a solution, good. Yeah, it's uh, giving me two solutions. Uh, let me keep them both. Uh, so I'll say, um, so souls is my previous output, and my solution one is so zero, and my solution two is so one. Yeah. Let me just make sure those variables are properly defined. Yeah, so, and the difference between them is in this plus minus portion. You know, did I take the, so here that would have been the minus sign that got picked up, so it became plus with that minus, or here it's got the plus sign that got picked up, so it became minus with the minus, yeah. So good. So one other reason I like using Sage Math is that you can use this tool to plug in numbers because uh, frankly, um, I make mistakes when I use calculators to, you know, plug in these numbers that are given and, um, and <laughs> doing it in Sage Math is one of the ways I can ensure that I don't make those silly calculator mistakes. So let me demonstrate using this to plug in numbers. So I have a sol1. It has a few bound methods. It's a Python thing. One of the bound methods will be sub, uh, subs for substitute. And you can actually just uh, kind of see with a documentation what kind of thing it, it is, what kind of syntax it takes, and all sorts of things. I think I'm going to use this um, the assignment to syntax, because that's the most uh, kind of natural looking thing. So I'm going to say, OK take this uh, expression, equation, and I'm going to substitute wherever I see v naught is going to be this, that's, uh, yeah. And the way I defined it now, it's a positive quantity, 2.0. I put the signs into the equation. Um, yeah, I did put signs into equation, right? Yeah, good. <laughs> Didn't forget to. And then I need to put in uh, g is equal to 9.8, and just remembering and h was 100 meters. And I'm putting these dots to make sure that it does decimal approximation. And I think that's all the numbers. So let's see what it gives. Oh, by the way, uh, when I do a uh, keystroke and it's evaluating, I'm doing shift to enter. That's the shortcut for evaluating whatever is in the cell and selecting below. 
So it says the time, okay, that minus sign worries me because um, I'm expecting all my times to be positive. So this minus sign, what it's really giving me is it's not actually telling me um, this time that I'm looking for. It's giving me this hypothetical time uh, on the other side of the projectile motion where there could have been uh, another T final <laughs> where um, where the ball was uh, on the ground and um, so it, it, this is not a realistic answer so I should be looking at the other answer that matches what I was expecting so solution two hopefully they'll have a positive answer for T final and um, that'll be uh, that'll be uh, what I'm looking for so. Yeah, this is a positive answer. So, so this is the T final I'm expecting, not the other hypothetical one that doesn't match to the reality that we are currently working with. So it says 4.32. So that's the time when it would land. Now, uh, unfortunately, that's not what I'm looking for. But the next step in this calculation is super simple, super quick. Because all I have to do is go back to this expression for range. And I now have T final, I can plug it, I can multiply it with my initial speed of 30, initial horizontal speed of 34 meters per, per, per second. And that should give me what the range is. So let me do 4.318065. Just keeping additional significant figures to be sure. I probably could have rounded it here, but that times uh, 34 meters per second. So 146. 0.8 or 147 meters. So let me plug that in to make sure um, that's the correct answer and then we'll take it from there. Uh, 100, what? Okay, 147. Um, it, it does, a, it grades it on basis of uh, tolerances. Uh, usually 1% tolerance is the default. So if you keep three significant figures, it should be fine. Uh, the system itself has programmed in, oh, I guess that, but <laughs> three significant figures, it should be graded most of the time correctly. Uh, rounding error shouldn't be an issue when you keep a minimum of three significant figures, maybe four in the intermediate numbers. So, so yeah, that's this question. Again, I want you to redo it because uh, um, it, <laughs> the version that I've done in the past has a sign error. And the only way to fix those sign errors is to, um, to just to redo the whole thing. So here I'm going to say, I use the Sage math. And you know, I, I do want people to know how to do it by hand, but uh, it's not like a, some cumbersome requirement where you must to do everything by hand. No, you can. Use, you are allowed to use, and in fact, you are encouraged to use computer algebra system whenever possible. Because when you are uh, a real engineer, real scientist, who are doing real work, uh, you'll you you won't be solving equations by hand most of the time. Yeah, because the algebra skill it's useful, but uh, for complicated, complex work, we use computer algebra system.